Well, good morning, Hillside friends and family. It's good to be able to connect with you again in Jesus' precious name. And, uh, you know, as we come together this morning, I just want to allow that precious name to saturate every part of who you are, uh, every part of your world, uh, every part of your fears, your concerns, but also your joys and your victories. Uh, all things, all things uh, are subject to the name of Jesus. And in that is our great peace. In that is our great confidence. Well, we gather today in this name, in his name, and uh, we are gathered today. I'm making a, a recording, a private recording, and just an audio recording of Sunday service. Uh, man, you know, we've started in this wonderful uh, series uh, called Beating the Locusts Back. Unfortunately, on Sunday, we had load shedding, and right in the middle of our recording, our electricity went off, and we lost uh, all our recordings and our data. But for those of you, our precious folk that are still not able to make the meetings, uh, and those folks that are not even our members but uh, enjoy our ministry, I uh, decided to make this recording just so that you don't miss out on uh, you know, some of the real substance of this message of God restoring back to His people. Uh, we need to get to understand the context of that restoration. Otherwise, you know, we miss such an important lesson attached to the blessing of restoration. So last week, you'll remember, uh, we spoke about uh, how um, God sends His army, and He sends His army against groups, uh, against corporations, uh, against families. I believe that God is doing a great work in humbling the collective. God will never send His locust army against an individual. No, but he humbles collectives. And boy, are we starting to see how collectives are falling. Uh, and they're falling because they have not softened their heart to the work and the wooing of God. Before God meets out judgment, he's always going to give ample time to repent. He's always going to give ample time to make things right. I mean, he's the God of reconciliation. That's why he sent his son, and that hasn't changed. And so we always take great confidence in knowing that whenever God allows some sort of uh, discipline or even punishment to come into our lives, He's doing it because He loves us as a Father and because He's got something far better in mind for us than we have in ourselves. We ha may have compromised with God's very best for us, but God never will compromise. You know, we've been rocked by seeing, uh, you know, even in the royal family, how that family is now carrying a, a big burden. And, you know, you, you make your own judgments. You know, uh, that's not what I want to go into now. But this is what I'm saying is even the most powerful families, because they're collective, are, are not immune to the judgments of God. They're not immune to say, listen, it's time to humble yourself. It's time to change things around. We have very powerful families throughout the world and families that have great sway and great control even over governments and influence and policies. Uh, these are things that the ordinary man on the street doesn't get to see. But let me tell you that God is a God that will humble even the greatest of families. He humbled Nebuchadnezzar in the Old Testament. And uh, when, once God has got his sights on you, uh, you know, like I say, first will come the wooing, first will come the gentle reproach and the correction. But if you have not used your influence, if you have not used the power of the collective that has been given to you, to God's glory and for good, you can expect a swarm of locusts to come. And, and I will even take a, a view of this, uh, even from a very personal standpoint, uh, as being a member of the church. We have seen how God, if you look through the church history and, and you look at some of the great atrocities that have been performed by the church uh, throughout history and how God has humbled this once mighty, uh, uh, powerful institution, even governments were afraid of the church at one stage. And, and when you look at what it has been reduced to, uh, you know, and even the big powerful mega churches today, let me tell you, they don't have a touch on the influence of what the church had in years gone by. But praise God, this is what I want to say. You will remember last uh, week when I spoke that God said that judgment begins at my house or at his house, his church, and, and, and with his people. 
here's the good news the good side is when god says that yes it's going to be tough but i believe that the remnant within the church those who humble their hearts to god's great working in the church are in for an amazing chapter that is about to open as god restores to them you see first god qualifies you before he gives you or adds to you and so when god has qualified his church through this wonderful purging cleaning work the church can look up to a time of restoration a time of power a time of authority like never before i believe the church in antiquity uh, was a church that had great power but unfortunately they used that power to accumulate physical and material wealth and influence uh, yeah they had their reasons for saying that and for justifying that but can you imagine how very different the world would be today can you imagine the difference in history if the church, instead of accumulating and running after the worldly wealth, the, the great cathedrals, the golden overlays, uh, you know, great palaces, uh, instead of running after that stuff, can you imagine if the church kept her focus strictly on spiritual wealth, spiritual authority? And I believe that we are coming to a place as a church where we are going to shake our heads and say, man, let's learn from history this time around when god restores unto his people their proper place let's walk on the proper path we're going to get into that in just a little bit of time perhaps next week as well as the spirit leads but today i want for us to take a, a time just to examine this army of god and how it operates and 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 how it operates in its effects you know like i said last week uh, and i've even mentioned briefly now god will never send his army against an individual and i believe that even when the army came against the locust army came against judah uh, many years ago i believe that there were righteous people amongst the citizens of judah and i believe that they were caught up in that swarm and doesn't mean because they were righteous that they were unaffected by how the the plague stripped those fields bare and how the plague came and ruined their crops so so here's what i'm saying you may be righteous but caught up in a swarm that is not of your own making it can be a swarm of family it can be a swarm in your business place people being retrenched uh, uh, investigations going on in the background auditing starting to happen people losing their jobs it can be a swarm in the church as i said a swarm in government oh boy are, are we noticing swarms in governments around this world now because even those governments no matter how righteous they pretend to be or claim to be have fallen into certain snares and god is not having it let's have a look now at how the swarm ha can march against the corporate the collective but how it can even affect an individual a and my brother my sister this is what i'm saying how it could even affect you perhaps you've been caught up in a swarm that is not your making or of your making but you're paying a big price yes here's the thing here's the thing although you're caught up in the swarm god gives to his children in that swarm and through that swarm an ability to withstand the swarm and to survive the swarm and in many cases to thrive even in spite of the swarm oh boy let's just think about for example joseph when that great famine came on the play uh, came on egypt uh, egypt thrived because of the wisdom that god gave to his child jacob now look you might go be going through a period where you've really had to cut back i mean if we think of how the swarm of COVID has ravaged our planet you you might be in a period where you've really had to cut back you think oh boy i'm really suffering and, and you can't see god's hand in you because you're doing with so much less let me just encourage you do you have a meal in front of you every day well praise god there's many people that don't do you have a roof over your head at night praise god there's many people that don't one of the beautiful things about a swarm is it gives you a fresh perspective it teaches you to to truly value those things that are worth valuing in life and to discard those things that are not worth valuing we allow things of such little value to cause us such stress but oh when god has done that hard work in us and we can have our mind focused totally upon our god do not worry about tomorrow said jesus have no anxiety have no worry 
because the God who cares off uh, for the sparrows of the field, the God who clothed uh, the lilies of the field better than Solomon in all his glory is the same God who looks after his children today. So, so let's have a look. I, in our reading, you'll remember we read Joel chapter 2, verses 18 to 25. I want to encourage you to go and do that reading for yourself again today. And I want you to look particularly at chapter 25. Now, in chapter 25, it gives a, a detailed, or not a detailed, but it gives a bit more of a description of this locust swarm. Well, you know, certain translations, the King James, for example, it gives different kinds of insects. It includes, for example, the caterpillar and the palmer worm. But I would go with those scholars that don't see different insects here, but they see different stages in the development of one kind of insect the locust, the locust. So the word arbe uh, speaks not just of a normal locust, but get this, speaks of a swarming locust. Now I want you to be a little bit crazy where you are right now. Just repeat after me the word swarming. It's a swarming locust because there's a difference here between a locust and a, a, and a swarming locust or a solitary or gregarious locust compared to a swarming locust. A, a swarming locust, although it's the same creature, it, it's transformed, it's metamorphosized, it, it, it's become a very different kind of insect. Uh, you see, the solitary locust is generally, it's a harmless little insect going about its business, uh, hopping here, uh, hopping there, uh, eating its, its, its grass, doesn't cause much trouble. But, but a swarming locust has undergone a transformation. It is far larger. It's got different body proportions. A swarming locust has even changed in its color, and it eats much more. In other words, this is what I'm saying. A swarming locust is an ordinary locust that has adapted to be far more destructive. Far more destructive. I want to encourage you, perhaps you've gone through something in your life that, that you, you may have just compromised with, that you may have allowed, that you may have permitted. And at one stage, it, it, was, it was almost benign. It was harmless. It was just a bit of an aggravation. But how that aggravation has started to grow over time, you need to be very aware of those things that you allow to continue in the background without addressing them. Because very often, things have got the ability to transform. Something that may have just been a small bother or, or a small distraction might mutate and become something that is extremely harmful in your life. Perhaps there's a little habit that you've been living with, a, a little compromise that you've been living with. Well, it doesn't hurt anybody. Uh, it's only me that knows about it. My brother, my sister, let me just uh, warn you, these things have got a way of transforming in their danger. They, they, they will transform to look very different. They will transform in, in their size, and they will certainly transform in their ability to cause destruction in your life. I think of some people, how they have compromised with alcohol in the beginning, or, or even smoking of cigarettes. Or, 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 or watching of pornography and oh, it's, it's harmless, it doesn't harm anybody, it's just me. Eventually, people are sitting with addictions that they cannot break and that's when the harm really starts. People start losing their health, people start losing their friends and, and, and close relationships, uh, marriages start to suffer. In the end, the innocent always suffer. And by the innocent, I mean extended family and even little children that are paying the price of those little habits that you perhaps once were compromising with. Take careful cognizance of these things in your life, my brother, my sister. Allow me to encourage you to allow the Holy Spirit to lead you to identify these things that have the ability to transform. Now here's the question I want to ask you. What does it actually look like when the once loosely ranked enemies start to unite and start to transform? Well, I think that original Hebrew word for the swarming locust, arbe, uh, can give us a bit of a clue. Because this word also implies a, a rapid increase. So get this. 
there may have been times where, 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 where something was banal, uh, so, uh, but something that was harmless or, or even weak or even insipid starts to gain momentum to the place where it can start to overpower and start to overwhelm. Now, each one of you, I'm sure, if you've worked on, walked on God's earth long enough, uh, you will have gone through a period of feeling overwhelmed or overpowered by life, a, a sense of suffocating through a situation or through a circumstance. Uh, perhaps you've gone through a period in your life where you feel it's a continual assault. Have you ever said these words, man, it's just one thing after another. I, I could handle one. I could handle ten. Uh, uh, Lord, give me strength. I could handle a couple of dozen, but it just seems like this has been the final straw. It's been one thing after another. And this type of assault leads you to a place where you are utterly exhausted. Utterly exhausted. Oh, don't underestimate the power of exhaustion in your life. And I'm not just talking about physical exhaustion. Man, if you go and run a marathon, or if you have a, a hard day of gardening out there where you are physically spent at the end of a day yeah you're physically tired but that's a great kind of tired I, I recommend that kind of tired for us to have good balance in our life at least two or three times a week get to a place where you are absolutely physically exhausted uh, whether it be through exercise or some other means good for you but man you get a different kind of exhaustion a and that is an emotional exhaustion if you're physically tired, you can go and jump up on the bed, have a good rest, and wake up refreshed. But if you're emotionally exhausted, no matter how tired you are physically, you toss and turn on that bed. You've got that knot in your stomach. You've always got a concern about this or worry about the next thing. Your sleep, no matter how tired you are, is always broken. You're exhausted. And that is one of the symptoms, one of the hallmarks that there has been a working of a swarm in your life. Now, now you would think that if we're tired and if we're exhausted, come on, let's, let's extend the military locust army metaphor here. You would think that if we were exhausted, that when we started feeling like this, we, we would start looking for an ally. You know, if you get into a place where you're overwhelmed, the first thing you should start doing is start looking around and looking for a bit of help. Uh, you know, uh, the, the, sometimes these swarms are actually designed to get us to shatter that shell around us and to start looking outside of ourselves to start getting some help. And this is why God has got His church there. Praise God, man, for His mercy. People are going through such tough times. There are so many swarms ravaging out there today. But God has created a haven for His people. He's created a church where people can come to to receive mercy. Now, I'm not talking about the charlatans out there that are pretending to be the church. Oh, no. I'm speaking about the remnant church. God has got His genuine place of rest for His people. No matter how exhausted you are, I want to point you to our beautiful Messiah, Jesus. Jesus knew about exhaustion. We, we, we read in the Bible where he sat by a well, exhausted and hungry. We, we, he knew about tiredness. And, and I thank God that we've got a high priest who came in a ministry in the form and body of man where he could come, where he could really sympathize with our, with our weaknesses. He could sympathize with our needs as human beings. Jesus experienced exhaustion. But can I tell you what Jesus promised? In Matthew chapter 11, 28, he said, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden. And what's his promise? If you come to me, he says, I will give you rest. And that is complete rest. Oh, my brother, my sister, if you're going through a time where you're exhausted and you, you, you say words like, I just wish that the planet would stop that I could jump off. Well, King David said something very similar. He said, oh, for the wings of a dove, that I could just fly away. If you're exhausted and if you're tired, let me point you in the direction of our blessed and beloved Lord and Savior, our Messiah, Jesus Christ. His arms are open to you. He's welcoming unto you. He's inviting you. 
only Jesus can give you the kind of rest. Because not only is he going to give you the rest for your physical body not and, and allow you to sleep well at night because he gives you rest also in your emotions as well he, he's the one that says peace i give to you and i don't give as the world gives so jesus is the one that gives us perfect peace but even better than that jesus gives you rest for your soul he gives you spiritual rest because he brings peace he he brings reconciliation between you and god the father and so rest let me tell you rest like worship rest is not just an action uh, rest is not a state it's not a verb rest is a place and jesus says come to me do you see what he's saying he's saying you need to relocate from where you are and come to me he says and i will give you rest now this is what i want to tell you this whole concept of a swarming locust the arbe even today scientists are not a hundred percent sure what it is that causes a gregarious or harmless locust all of a sudden to go through or to initiate the stage of transformation to initiate this this transformation into something that is lethal to humanity one 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 of the things that they do say that they've pinpointed that they say is a very strong possibility is they say that during landing and during takeoff a single flying flying locust that's one in a bunch a single flying locust it emits a noise with a certain frequency with with its wings and this noise influences the gregarious behavior observed in swarms you, you, you know you know what it is it starts off with one just one that is rubbing its wings in a certain frequency or in a certain pitch you, you know if, when we when we've come through let's just look at historically it takes one darwin to start a buzzing and a swarm it takes one marx one lenin one putin one trump one biden you, you know i'm just mentioning people here that have had influence and of course you can think of so many one hitler so many others in the past that can spark something that is ravenous that 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 rages across nations and across the globe as well it takes one voice sometimes just elevated and e echoed under the right conditions that causes a swarm and the next thing although you're far away all you can hear is the buzzing and the humming of locusts wings yeah, this is a buzzing and a humming that can move the swarm more than 150 kilometers a day do you get that 150 kilometers a day and here's the problem when you all got this all this buzzing in your ear this is what it sounds like you're late this is what it sounds like those deadlines those targets are not met this is what it sounds like the inner dialogue i don't know how i'm going to get through the month this month i don't know how i'm going to pay those debts my loved one is sick Am I going to experience another loss? What happens if so and so found, finds out about such and such? And all the noise that buzzes in your head. The problem with this buzzing is when you're overwhelmed with the sound of locust wings. When buzzing is all you can hear, then you find it difficult to hear from God. Because your attention has now been changed. The allegiance of your ears has now been changed. And the problem with not hearing from God, the Romans 10, 17 tells us that faith comes from hearing. Now, when you can't hear from God, not only do you face this, this, this army without uh, strength, without energy, without vigor, uh, without direction, not only are you at an utter loss, but now you don't have the kind of faith that you need to overcome the situation and the circumstance that you're in. All you hear is the buzzing of locust swings. You don't hear the voice of God in those beautiful scriptures there are that where God promises you, I am with you. I will never, no, never will I leave you, nor will I forsake you. You can't hear those promises of scriptures that tell you that you're more than an overcomer in Christ Jesus. 
Uh, you, you're, you're, you can't remember those promises where God has promised you, you're the apple of my eye. Man, I've got you covered under the shadow of my wing. I've got you engraved on the palms of my hand. You, you can't hear those things because you're overwhelmed by the sound of locust wing. And the thing is this, is as a child, remember I spoke about this last week, when a child is, is caught up in the midst of a swarm, a child of God has got an ability in the midst of that swarm that nobody else has got. He's got the ability to stand and face that swarm and start quoting the scriptures and the promises of God. And although that, those wings are buzzing, although the army is marching, I need you to see this in your mind while, while I'm speaking. The child of God looks at that army and because he's quoting the scriptures, just like the angel of death uh, that would not enter the house of of the children of Israel when the plagues of Egypt came. The angel of death passed over those houses because he saw the blood of Jesus. Now listen to me. When you stand and, and you stand in faith, even in the face of the swarm of locusts, that swarm of locusts is going to start moving around you. You need to see this in your mind's eye. That's not going to stop the marching of the swarm, but the swarm is going to start making a wide berth around you. And you and all those that are connected with you are going to be covered under the blood of Jesus. And you can still speak the promises of Christ, even in the midst of a marching swarm, even in the midst of those buzzing and humming locust wings. God has promised. He said, I will instruct you. I will teach you in the way that you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you when you feel overwhelmed and you don't know where to go you don't know what to do you've got a god that said i will teach you i'm gonna show you the way that you shall go now you know when i when i read these scriptures when i read this passage and i look at how the prophet joel has laid things out it seems to me that joel has reversed the develop, developmental stages of the locust year you know if, if i was gonna write a narrative or write a text here you know I, I would go in the logical progression i would go sort of the eggs into the nymph or, which is the young locust and then into the different stages of the the nymph some people say you've got to, up to five different developmental stages of the nymph until you get to the locust stage that, that would be my order but joel starts off with the adult he doesn't start off with the egg or the nymph and, and i think to myself why and, and there could be many reasons for this, and, but I, I believe there's, there's two main reasons why this is the case. Firstly, I think that Joel wants to emphasize that, that what we're dealing with here is a recurring plague that happened year after year. You see, God promised uh, in, in verse 25, he said, I will restore to you the years, not the year. He said, the years. So... This is what I believe Joel is showing us. When you have the locust or the adult locust, something that is implicit in the locust itself, or speaking about the adult locust, is, is something that Joel doesn't mention, but like I say, it's implicit. It is implied. Is after the locust comes the eggs. And after the eggs, because you see, the nymphs don't have the ability to reproduce. They've got the ability to consume and to destroy, but not to reproduce. And so what I believe that Joel is busy teaching us here, just looking at the adult phase. Yes, the adult was voracious in his appetite. That's why they called it the stripper. It would strip things bare, nothing left on trees or plants. But, but more than that, he had the ability to reproduce. And, and, and this also, secondly, B reveal something of the insidious nature of the enemy. You see, they leave behind a, a stage in the life cycle that the prophet doesn't mention, that stage of eggs. And eggs, obviously, is, 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 a, is a very important developmental stage. It speaks of reproduction. But, but listen to me now. Listen to me now. What it speaks of is although the locusts are gone, you think that the storm is over. You just start gathering yourself again and thinking, whew, we've dodged a bit of a bullet, we've overcome that. 
Be very careful for what has been buried. Be very careful for what lies under the surface. Something is buried that is waiting to birth a disaster. And you would think that it would be harmless. I mean, goodness, what are the little eggs? Well, this takes us back to my opening thoughts when I was talking about those things that seem to be harmless that we've been compromising with. And, and you know, this, this might not even be an attitude or a problem or, 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 or life uh, a sin in our own lives. This, this might be sort of compromising with the way you allow other people to treat you. I love what some, uh, I heard somebody saying, you teach people how to treat you. And perhaps you're in a toxic negative situation or, or relationship with somebody, maybe a boss, uh, maybe a, a, a life partner where these people are taking advantage of you or these people are placing burdens upon you and you're allowing them to do it. And you think, no, just wait. That egg is still going to give birth. But there's something here that I want to attach before I make my conclusion. And that brings us to another developmental stage. So what we have here is we have the prophet mentioning the adult phase of the locust, the swarming locust, which leads us then into, look at the connection, the egg phase, which leads us now into the developmental stages as mentioned by the prophet. And the prophet speaks about three different developmental stages of the nymph. And the first one he mentions is the hopper. Now, maybe you've seen this somewhere on Discovery Channel or some of the nature programs, National Geographic or something like that, where you've seen swarms of these little hoppers running across the desert ground. In fact, I had it in, 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 one of my, in the promo that I released uh, for this series. There you will see some little nymphs and, and lots of them moving across the ground. And these are wingless little larva, and, and they, so they can't fly. So the only way they move around is by hopping. They can't even walk yet. They just hop, and that's why they call them hoppers. Now, we might think, listen, these are just little guys, man. They're just small. But here's the thing. Nymphs have got a more voracious appetite than even the adults. They can consume more than the adults. So we think, oh, no, well, they're still so small. But these little guys, they've got some growing to do, man. And they are voracious in their pursuit of their growth. They will wipe it out. The Hebrew word for hopper is the word yalek. Yalek speaks, like, speaks of licking up or, or devouring completely and then licking up. Uh, just the other day, we had some pudding in our home. And I tell you something, my kids licked up those bowls. There was nothing left. There comes a phase where you put, where you put down the, t the spoons and then you pick up the fingers, man, and you make sure there's nothing left on the bottom of those bowls. That's what my, how my kids treat pudding in my house. But this is how the nymphs treat also whatever is in front of them. They lick it up. So while they're still in that nymph stage, you lick. But more specifically... The Hebrew word here points to a loss of hope. The hopper literally devours your hope. Now get this. Let's take this back. Now let's make the connection to the eggs. And I think, and I think that the prophet didn't mention eggs in the developmental stage because the, 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 the working of the eggs is so closely tied to what we're speaking here of the hopper. Once the adult locust is gone, the adult locust lays the eggs insidious because you don't see them, but there they are, lying and waiting. Then what happens is it waits for the rains to come. And once the rains come, the eggs hatch. But, but the average person, the farmer, the person in produce, or the average citizen is also waiting for the rains to come. Now you must think of what his or her mindset is going to be. This person has just gone through a cycle, perhaps a couple of cycles, of these locusts ravaging. They see the rain clouds coming and they think to themselves, thank goodness. I don't know why people say thank goodness. don't know who goodness is. It's probably people that don't know God because we say thank God. But they would say, thank goodness. Here comes the rain at least. Now they start getting excited. And they, 
Well, finally, this locust plague is over. We can start preparing our grounds now, start planting our crops. And they do that, and they plant their little crops, and, and then they think, well, maybe we can just recover. Boy, it's going to be tough. And no sooner do the rains come that these little buds start shooting out of the crops that they grow. But it's not just the buds that shoot out. So do, so too does the hopper, the little nymphs that come out. And, and, and that shooting, that little, that little sprout of hope just gets licked up. Now listen, one of the saddest sights that I can say I've ever beheld. Now there's many. I mean, it's just part of the fallen world that we live in. Praise God for all the beauty and the wonderful things. But oh boy, are we surrounded also by very many sad things. And, and this, is, this is part of our job description as a church is to come and shine the light in the midst of all the darkness that is out there. But one of the saddest sights to behold, I believe, is a human being, a man or woman, and increasingly in this day and age, even young children who have been stripped of hope. This is somebody who just one too many times has gone through a, a season of being decimated or stripped and they, they finally they find their strength and they summon it up, summon up their strength and they, they plant again and go through everything. And they make those loans. They get the business going again. And all of a sudden, uh, a, a crooked partner wipes them out. This is somebody that's gone through a tragic marriage and been abused uh, physically and, and emotionally in a marriage and, 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 and then they get a second chance and they get remarried somewhere along the lines and, they, and everything's good and the ro rosy in the beginning and just a few months later their new partner starts showing exactly the same colors as their old partner. Somebody that's given up on studying or education. Somebody that's just given up because life is too much. Th these are not bad people. Just please understand me. These are not lazy people. These are not layabouts. These are people who have tried again and again and again. But again and again and again, it just seems like life has knocked the, the will to live, knocked the energy, knocked the stuffing out of them. Oh boy. One of the saddest sights to behold is someone who has been stripped of hope. Yalek, the first phase of the developmental stage of the hopper. Now, now, just as I introduced the exhausted, the tired, the depleted to the Jesus who said, come unto me and I will give you rest. Let me just turn the direction of the hopeless to the God whom the Bible writes of as being the God of hope. In fact, Romans 5.13 speaks of this God of hope who wants to fill you with all joy and peace in believing. You, you, see, you see how it attaches joy and peace to believing? No wonder why the enemy wants to wipe out your belief system because if he can get you there, then he's got your joy and he's got your peace as well. Without joy, you're miserable. Without peace, you're full of anxiety. You will be an, an, an anxious misery without belief in your life. Hear me. But listen to what the God of peace wants to fill you. He wants to fill you. So if you're depleted and empty, He wants to fill you with joy and peace in believing. Why? goes on to say, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Abound. Not just have drips and drabs. Now I'm speaking life to somebody that has gone through a season of hopelessness. I I'm speaking life. Because if you know what it's like to live where all the colors of life has been drained out, mundane monotony, instead of the iridescent colors, reds, blues, pinks, beauty, beautiful colors of life, life has become a, a monotone humdrum of gray. Well, let me speak life. Let, let me introduce to you, or, or let me reintroduce you to the God of hope. Why? Because that hope is not set upon anything that the locust can consume. The locust, moth or rust. No, no, no. Your hope is set upon Him and upon Him only. And, 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 and our treasures are laid up where moth and rust and locust cannot consume because they're in Him. Wouldn't it be beautiful to know that perhaps this final time you can pick yourself up, get the energy from God 
from the Jesus who has given you the rest. Take that rest and invest it. It wouldn't be good to know that that rest you can invest into hope again. And this time, your hope will not disappoint you. Well, there's another, another phase that Joel mentions. He mentions the destroyer, the hopper, the destroyer. Another developmental stage of the locust or the nymph. The Hebrew word for destroyer is korsil. And this also speaks about devouring. But get this, whereas the hopper devours your hope, the destroyer devours confidence and boldness. You, you get to this place where you just don't have the boldness to tackle uh, uh, those things that are robbing you of the essence of your life, those people that are walking over you. But even more than that, you don't have the confidence in, in, in your God-given abilities to appropriate those things, those blessings that God has put out on your path for you. You know, when I, when I think of somebody that doesn't have confidence or boldness, this speaks of somebody that has a stooped disposition, somebody that is bowed over, always apologetic, uh, always trying to give an excuse. This is not just speaking about personal confidence and boldness. Did you know that it is a wonderful scriptural principle to pray for boldness? The disciples came together in the book of Acts and they asked God to give them boldness so that when God stretched out his hand, they could perform mighty miracles. But you see the essence there? We need to get our boldness placed in Christ Jesus. We need to get our confidence put in him. So if you've been stripped of boldness, my brother, my sister, if Corsil, the destroyer, has ravaged your confidence and boldness, thank God. Because if your confidence and boldness was in the right place to begin with, it wouldn't have been able to be stripped. But when we pray for boldness as Christ's children, as Christ's body, we pray for boldness in Him. Confidence in Him. You see, if you don't have confidence and boldness, the, the next logical stage, the, the next logical conclusion after losing your confidence and boldness is the introduction, the infusion, the injection of fear. For without boldness, without confidence, fear is, is, is it's going to happen. But listen to me. Fear is not just about being afraid of something. There's something deeper. I believe this speaks about the kind of fear that convinces you that God is a liar. You say, well, yeah, I believe in God. I've never believed God is a liar. Come on, let's check out the evidence. Let's check out the fruit in your life. If you truly believed God, if you truly believed the promises that God has got for you and God has made to you, you wouldn't be afraid for your health. You wouldn't be afraid for your provision. You wouldn't be afraid for your family. You wouldn't be afraid for your future. And you wouldn't be afraid for your eternity. But we allow all sorts of fears to creep into our lives. And, and when we get to the bottom of it, when, 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 when we allow the fear to run its course, the logical conclusion, the only conclusion that we can make is that we allow, we have this fear in our lives because we have not believed God. We've not believed God's word and God's promises in our life. Thank God for core seal. Because core seal reveals to you an illusion perhaps that you had about God. But once core seal strips away the false boldness and the false confidence, then thank God that now you can start working on the true boldness and the true confidence. See, because if, if, you, if you allow yourself, even subliminally, even without realizing it, to think that God is a liar, if you're not absolutely convinced in all of His promises. And it starts off with being afraid for the things of this life, fear of this time, fear of crime, fear of corruption, fear of all these things. But eventually that fear is taking you to a place. And that happens when a child of God begins to fear God. You've lost confidence in His salvation for you. And Hebrews 10, 27 speaks of those who have a fearful expectation of judgment. No! Oh. I, 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 my, my, my heart is, is, is overwhelmed. My heart floods. It overflows with love and compassion for all those Christians who don't know how deeply God loves them. 
and, and don't know how precious they are they are to him and don't know that he is their loving heavenly father with his his arms stretched out as unto the the prodigal saying come unto me i love you i love you i love you don't fear me i love you come to your father approach the throne of grace with confidence the book of hebrews says because you're in christ jesus but the book of hebrews i believe speaks of those that are willingly fallen away from god and god's will for their lives but we need to attach to that 1 john 4 verse 18 where it says perfect love casts out fear because fear has to do with punishment and when you are are, are convinced when you know the truth of god that you're the apple of his eye you will not fear punishment because you know that what God does for you, in you, around you, is not to do with punishing you. It is to do with disciplining you. Because the book of Hebrews says we must not despise the discipline of the Lord. Because then he's treating us as sons. His discipline is an instrument that he uses to make us more like Jesus. Core seal, even. The discipline of core seal, even has a great purpose where it comes to strip out the bad, comes to strip out the false, the false confidence, the false boldness. But it comes to impart into you the truth, the authentic love of the authentic God that we serve. Final developmental stage is the cutter. The Hebrew word here for cutter is the word gozom. This also speaks of devouring, isn't it? You see, all three stages of the nymph and even the adult speak of devouring, but, but there's just a different angle. Yeah. Speaks of devouring too, but here it speaks of cutting off. It, it speaks of cutting off and filling with sorrow or grief. Sorrow or grief. When, when I speak about sorrow or grief, and, and when we, we, we look at those two words together, it, it elicits in my thinking process another word, I suppose, that encapsulates those two perfectly. And that's the word bereavement. Bereavement. Now get this. The cutter cuts something off. You, you think perhaps of, of maybe a hollow fiber or a stem or a shoot or something that gets cut off. And when it falls to the ground, it's not like a flat leaf blade. I'm just using an example, using my mind here. But it's, it's something that gets cut off, maybe a, a tubular type of plant or leaf. And when it cuts off, there it lies and it's empty. And, and not only is it empty, because, you know, empty is sad enough as it is, but it's worse than empty. It's filled with something. But it's filled with sorrow or grief. And, and when you see the life cycle after everything that you've just been through, after being stripped after having your, 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 your everything taken away from you by the stripper those relationships that workplace that that work that stuff that you've been through you know that aspiration and, and then when you go through that you go through a phase of hopelessness and and then you go through this phase of of even your inner confidence being taken away and fear and now what that little bit that has been left has been cut off and filled with bereavement I want to take a moment to speak to some of you who are listening to me, and I, and I want to address that a deep sadness in you. There's something sad, and it's so deep. And it's because there's been something that you've been carrying around for years and years and years. Perhaps some of you don't even know why you feel the way you feel, but it's just like you're sad, and you're hurt, and you feel wounded in a way, and you've, you've found little coping mechanisms on how to hide it and how to conceal it. But you're sad. Here's why. Here's why. You're bereaved. You're bereaved. It's not just a sadness. It's more of a grief and sorrow. And perhaps it's because at one stage you had a sense of purpose, but you've been stripped of that sense of purpose. You, you've forgotten. You don't have that excitement of waking up every day and saying, well, let's move closer to this purpose. Let's see how this day is going to get me closer. Perhaps once you had a dream of doing something big or being somebody, but you've been stripped. Per perhaps once you belonged to somebody or they belonged to you, but because of a cruel twist of fate, you've been stripped. Sorrow and grief. Now, you know, in Romans 5.13, I remind you there that it spoke of the God of hope who fills you with joy and peace in believing. He fills you with joy and peace in believing. 
Well, I want to tell you that Psalm 34, 17 and 18, if you're sad in your heart, it says, when the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. Listen to this. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. If you're sad, I want to make you a promise from the Bible. God is near to you. He's nearer to you right now than you know. If you've been carrying something for years and you've just not even contemplated putting it down because even that sadness has been some sort of a comfort to you because sadness at least is not emptiness. I want to tell you there's a God that is near to you right now. It's the same Jesus who still has his arms open to you saying, come to me. It's the same God who is the God of hope. It's the same God who promises us not just love, but perfect love. It's that same God. And I'm here to tell you that, that he's near to you and he hears your cry for help. Would, would, would you this morning or this evening or whatever time of day it is you're listening, would you just cry out to him? If there's somebody sitting next to you, just say, excuse me a moment. I'm just going to have a moment with God. Go with me here and just put your hands up and say, oh, Lord, my God, oh, Lord, my God. I'm sad, I'm sore, I'm broken, I'm tired, I'm exhausted. And, and I see it for the first time now. I see the swarm. I've never seen it before, but I identify some of these things. But I, I'm now filled with hope because I realize that I can have the faith to stand up and to say to the swarm, so far and no further, I have the ability to pronounce the promises of God that make the swarm go around me and not cover me and come over me. And, and so, Lord God, I, I know I'm still tired and I'm exhausted, but I'm reaching out to you now, Jesus. I reach out. My, would you take my hand? Would you take my heart? Would you take me and give me another chance? And allow me to be who you wanted me to be in the midst of the swarm. I want that opportunity. I, I want a fresh start with you. Give me fresh boldness and confidence in you and who the Bible says you are. The all-powerful, almighty God who 2,000 years ago took a body of flesh in the form of Jesus Christ to come and pay a price for me. And I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that you're the Son of God. You died and you were raised to life again on the third day. I recommit my life to you. I love you. I know it sounds don't even know where that comes from. I feel so numb in myself, but I want to say I love you. And as dead and as empty as that love feels right now, I give it to you and I ask you to make something more of it. This is my heart's cry. It's my heart's cry to you right now. It's my heart's cry. If you pray that prayer, I want to promise you God has heard it. And we serve a good God and a mighty God. And I want to promise you, you're going to start seeing things changing in your circumstances. No matter where you are or who you are or where you're listening, I want to encourage you to, if you're listening to this word, if you don't belong to a Bible-preaching church, you need to get with the fellowship of God. I'm going to be preaching about this next week. How important church is. Because once God has sent the swarm against His church, that which is pure will achieve His purpose for His people. It will achieve His purpose for His people. You need to get with people that have been where you are people that have come through it and get with other people that can come around you and walk with you and love you through the situation that's christ's plan for your life don't think of what people make the church to be or who they say it is you go and have your own experience of church man because i believe the holy spirit has led you to this and i believe the holy spirit will lead you to a true bible preaching church that honors christ as god I want to bless you. I want to speak God's blessing upon you. May you be filled with the confidence and boldness to step into the new life that God has got for you. May you always be aware of how very precious you are to Him and how dearly He loves you. Bye-bye.